So in, before introducing our speaker this afternoon, I want to express our thanks to the Stora family who have very generously endowed these lectures which permit us to bring to Davis on a regular basis truly exceptional people to uh, tell us about the, the fascination and the strength and the power of modern science. And our speaker today is truly one of those exceptional people. He's truly an exceptional person. He's Pashko Rakic, and I think it is no exaggeration to say that Pashko is one of the most distinguished neuroscientists working today. He's had a long career in neuroscience, and going back for more than 30 years, his work has been at the forefront of modern developmental neuroscience. Indeed, I think uh, he can be said to be one of the founders of that field in its, in its modern form. And what especially characterizes Pashko's work is not only its utilization of truly cutting-edge technology to address some of the most fundamental issues of the way in which the brain and the nervous system generally develops, but also his special focus upon the primate, including the human brain, which is quite unique, and I think many modern developmental neurobiologists hardly think beyond that of the mouse. But after all, if we want to understand ourselves and how our brain develops, then we must go to our nearest relatives. And Pasco, certainly, for those of you who heard his talk yesterday, has thought very deeply and very long and very hard and very productively about this. Pasco Rakic is currently the Duberg Professor of Neurobiology and Neurology at Yale University, and he is the chair of the Department of Neurobiology. It's a department that he founded many years ago, and he told me today that he's approaching his 30th year as a chairman. How anyone could have such persistence. <laughs> Pasco has been distinguished in many ways. He's been president of the Society for Neuroscience. He has won many, perhaps most, of the most prestigious awards in science and in neuroscience in particular. And he's also been elected to virtually every one of the more important honor societies from the National Academy down. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Pashko Rakic, who will talk about molecular mechanisms of neuronal migration and disorders of neuronal position. Pashko. Thank you very much, Deb. Well, I'm glad to be able to give you now a second lecture. And you see, yesterday I talked about evolution and indulge myself to share with you. I think, did most of you were yesterday than the lecture? Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, and I would say that I couldn't give a, not that I couldn't give a lecture, but I think evolution couldn't occur. This brain, this cortex couldn't develop if evolution didn't make possible process of neuronal migration. Because you remember how cells are not generated in the cortex. They have to come there. You have to have machinery. And today I will devote my lecture to the molecular mechanism and genetic mechanism, how this, this marvelous process could occur. And that interests me all my scientific life from the early stages when I discovered the cell uh, migrate in relationship to radial glial cells to these days where we can do things that I couldn't even imagine possible at the time when I entered the field. Now, Ted mentioned a primate brain and human brain. And if I didn't start with the primate brain, or human, in the, for that matter, I probably wouldn't be in that field. Because what interests me, if these cells, all these cells on the cortex are not generated there, how they migrate? And this particular is a question, how they do it in a convoluted brain, like a human and monkey brain, and mouse is you know, a smooth lysencephalic brain. And how they cell come? And I will show you that slide you know, since you were last year, uh, last yesterday there, you recognize basic principles. But many, when I show you a movie, it was in mouse. But if you, this is a human uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, I did also that many years ago with Levitt uh, uh, in, the, in the monkey. But these actually slides are, two slides are in human. This is a monkey uh, slide. 
And you see, radial glia is very long, unbelievably long, compared, say, to in the mouse. And so in the mouse, you get one or maximum two cells migrating at the same time along the radial glia pathway. Here I counted like a 32 cell are going brown is radial glia stained with glial acid fibrillary protein. And you could count 32 cells which are blue, not stained, they're different. They migrate and they migrate like that. Now, I just anticipate question. People said, okay, so it is like this and this and these cells are generated and come to the proper position. And so radial glia enable them to follow so that they are in relative position to each other there. Um, um, is, is preserved from ventricle, relative position, positional information to the cortex. But then how radial glia find the way? Well, radial glia stay over there all the time, and this is work done in monkey, and I promised Ted to, to do that. You see, we published that long ago, and we, we time it in study. So when you look at young age, like here at, the, say, 60 embryonic or 50 embryonic day in mouse, in monkey, and when brain is still relatively small, telencephalic wall, this radial glia, and then when it grows and starts to make coevolution, and this radial glia are the same. We label them with thymidine and the last cell division, and they still label for next two months while they serve as a pathway or highway for migrants. So evolution decided, and this is not so far a discovery similar in the mouse, that it's very important to have those cells early and keep them differentiated. So GFAP positivity, this radial glial scapel uh, 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 protein is not present in rodents uh, in early stages. In monkey, we have shown that is present from the beginning of neurogenesis, of cortical neurogenesis, as so is in human shown by Choi and Lafam and other people. Now, this I want also to show you. It's, I mentioned yesterday that ventricular zone is a map. I call it propto map. And that in area 17, for example, there are more produced, more cells for layer 4 than in area 18. Other people like Kennedy and in, in France and so on have shown that too. So here are produced more cells than here. There are different cells. So why this have scaffolding is the cells which are for area 17 go to area 17 and 18 go to 18. Otherwise, 17 or 18 could go straight like that, would be shorter pathway, and would be in the wrong place. There are specifies, and now more and more papers are coming that there are specifies in the ventricular zone. That was significant, 17, 18. And I'll show you another experiment in monkey that probably I couldn't do. Oh, this is just to remind you that it, this, is, this is for area 17. You remember yesterday's slide. I will not show any other except these two slides from yesterday. And the reason is that I failed to maybe make very clear. Early cells are generated first uh, oh, and occupy D position. The next one come in front and front, and the last one come here. Now, what I didn't mention is that this is for area 17, but for other areas, this is, for example, singular cortex, it finished, you have different curve, finished by 70 embryonic day, and say, um, this is uh, area 46, is prefrontal cortex is finished by 90 embryonic days. So every area have a different timing when they are finished. At the end of the talk, you will see significance of that slide. I think it's tremendously important for medical implication. Because at every, depending, at every day, if you have, say, mother exposed to toxic agent or radiation, would affect different cells 60 embryonic day compared to 80. I will go to that in a moment. It will be different symptoms. So that same insult could produce totally different. This is why it's difficult to catch diagnosis, because anything can be mimicked depending on, the, on the just the day or time. Now you say, well, is it brain is plastic? Is it that specific that, for example, here is generating only 
certain type of cell in area 17 and this type in 18. I'll show you example. And by the way, another uh, difference, evolutionary difference between monkey, say, this is monkey, and mouse. It's very sharp. This is in monkey. In, in mouse is inside out. First are generated deep and superficial, but they kind of overlap. But in monkey, because it's long, maybe duration of genesis, it's two months, in mouse only seven days. You injection, one injection of time in the labor, say here only, this is layer four A, B, C. Only four C, only one type of cell, you see? Now, why is it important? And whether this is specified for four C, I will give you evidence. Uh, this we published a few years ago now, 10 years ago, in General Comparative Neurology. It's quoted only nine times, or 19, I forgot. I don't know why people didn't pay attention, but I think it's important. What we did, we took a monkey, and we know that at 70 embryonic day, for example, are generated these cells in area 18. Layer four, it's thinner than 17. And if you irradiate X, the same amount of radiation would be given if you have a breast cancer and you kill the dividing cell. A 70, at that time, 70 to 73 days, and this is how much we put. Now it's measured GI, used to be RADS. You eliminate that cells. Then you let animal to survive, it has empty space here. And it's not empty, I mean, it's with EM, you see it's a lot of processes. And you see the cells didn't migrate because it's also in white matter, you have ectopic neurons because it interfere with migration. But that uh, remained empty. In other words, next cells did not just fill that empty space. They make now next that they are supposed to make. There is a missing something. You see the point? If mother is exposed to radiation, like in Chernobyl, at one point, different mother, depending how old are pregnancy, will have totally different malformation or disorder of the, of the brain in that uh, 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 child. And now you see 1817 proof for that what I show you in the slide there. When we irradiated in 17, we were missing these cells. In 18, we were missing these cells because they're generated in different layers at different time in different areas. This is now confirmed by modern method I mentioned yesterday, paper by, by um, Rubinstein and so on. But this was with a very simple irradiation of the monkey as time of pregnancy. Now I go, this is kind of to, to get a feeling how important is the cells are generated right time, might get the proper speed and come right place in proper sequence. But to do that, you have to have molecular mechanism. And this is what I want to share with you. Even when I entered the field, and I cannot hide it, um, uh, as I said, uh, you know, he mentioned 30 years as chairman, but this I published in 1972. So, you know, I look young, but I'm not that young. <laughs> okay, so I published that. At that time, we already thought how it, 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 it works. Um, you see extension of the leading process and followed by nuclear translocation. So this is, and then immediately thought at that time, it must be differential cell adhesion because adhesion, it go along radially, so it must be attached and uh, move. And then since this, and I'm talking on radial migration, go along glial fiber, I call it gliophilic, thinking they like glia, you know? And there are some other migration, and I have actually slides, but I, to make simpler my talk, I didn't show tangential migration. I call it neurophilic. And even at that time, we knew about that in 1972, uh, because they go along other pathways horizontally. Then it has to translocate of the nucleus and surrounding cytoplasm. One difference between, I mentioned many people study how ax connections are made. Axon grow and make connections. The nucleus stay here. But in neural migration, leading process grow, and then nucleus translocate. You have to have molecular a cell biological process of that. So I call nuclear translocation. And then at one point, you have to stop 
because it doesn't go all the way to the pier. It stops at the border of layer two and the marginal zone, which become layer one. So set learning pattern. Each of these, now I will go with you how this occur. Okay, so this is what I did. Uh, this is 1981. I apply for grant, and this is actually in my grant. I simplify that whole complicated process so that sometimes I put even people in study section could understand. <laughs> uh, didn't work, you know. You cannot even that make it that simple. But anyway, what I did, that was 25 years ago, as you see. I said, you see, and we have some evidence for that. This is, by the way, at that time we did EM, and this is radial glia. We know that it's adhesion because there is an extracellular space, but here they remain attached even when fixation is loose a little because they have adhesion. So they grow by adding new membrane. Up, you see this membrane grow, and then I put with the dotted line another and more membrane. So this is how they grow. It's not that they move like a, like a sailing ship. And so I said, well, it must be, since they grow along, prefer about radial glia, it must be some kind of antigen antibody. So it is heterotypic NG uh, cell adhesion molecule. In fact, I invented that name, and later on that was used by Jerry Edelman, who worked on that field for a while at that time when he was still in New York. And then what happened when this process extend, like this one you see, the nucleus move, so this is tip top of the nucleus, go to the next stage, nucleus within that. And what that means, you see these arrows, that individual membrane which is attached to each other, it doesn't have to move, so it's not going like that. It's just grow new, it's like a tank having never move, you know, uh, 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 around the, the pathway. So this is like a suggestion, and I thought it simple. Nuclear translocation need contracted proteins, so I said, I need only to have two molecules, heterotypic NG and CAM, and contractile protein to move the nucleus. So I was right in terms of process, but I was wrong in this respect. There is no simple solution for the complex problems. That's what I learned over time. So these are now regulation of the step in neuronal migration. And we know now genes or have candidate genes and molecules and signal, signal pathway for each of them. We don't know everything, but know for each. Control a mode of cell division. I start with that. Yesterday, I kind of introduced you in that. Now I want just to point out what it means. And later on, when I talk with, uh, with Ted, I recognize I didn't maybe make it very clear. You see, in initially, these are, in monkey, already radial glia, or these are uh, neuroepithelial cells. This is a question of name. They make more and more of those. This is symmetric division. However, at one point, one of these cells start to develop asymmetrically, make a neuron which then go and migrate up along, so to speak, daughter cell migrate along process of mother cell. And I think you have here probably talk, I understand that you're recruiting uh, Steve Nectar here. Okay, he, he uh, uh, have shown that in, in mouse, how they also go along that way. Then there is another, this make this cell neural progenitor, and then it go there and make so-called subventricular cell. We used to call subventricular, now people call it intermediate progenitors, but this is the same cell that we knew is a subventricular cell for long ago, and then they produce, oops, I didn't put here, I should put arrow, they produce, produce at least in monkey, at least at that time, uh, gabergic also interneurons. Some interneurons come radial in mouse most, but in monkey and human majority come from this subventricular zone. So I'm just telling you what is happening now. It, for this symmetric asymmetric division, I mentioned yesterday these two no molecules, notch and num, which is inhibitor of notch. And notch is molecule which is cell surface receptor, it have ligands and so on. I show that's all 
I have said before, this is the third slide that I showed yesterday. But I have different explanation. You know, yeah, you could give the same talk all the time and uh, give a different uh, slides, or you can get the same slides a different talk. <laughs> uh, and so I'm using the same uh, uh, slide, but I want to make a point to you, okay? which I didn't have time yesterday because I was so busy with the very intellectual and conceptual issues, non-scientific. Uh, you see, and other people made a mistake. You see notch, this is NICD, I mean new, um, intracellular domain uh, notch. This is active part of notch, cleaved notch. And its inhibitor numbs are present, and if you look at fluorescent microscope, even with confocal, you see this in this cell asymmetrically. And other people, including Jan Laboratory in San Francisco and um, Susan McConnell in um, Stanford and so on, they concluded that this is asymmetrical per the in, in, in dividing cell. And this I want to make a point to young people. That's not sufficient. You have to use electron microscope. When we did electron microscopy of those cells, this is how you see it here. You see that actually NAM and NS is not in this part of the dividing cell. It is in adjacent processes of radial glial cell. You see? But it go below there, you don't see clearly. So uh, still, if you want a nuclear cellular or, or, or uh, uh, how to say, supracellular, um, uh, uh, the uh, distribution of molecule, you have to use EM. This is called EM immunohistochemistry. I'll show you in a moment there are other ways to do it. We just, uh, that paper is in, in press uh, right now, but I'm just sharing with you. And you see, you could use it maybe with a confocal microscope. You see how difficult it would be and boost it an angle. And you send that paper and they say, oh, you cannot say that, it's not clear. So you have to do, when you do EM, very clear, you see. This is not in the dividing cell. When you show it in higher power, this is what it is. Then you remember wh what is the significance of that, that it's radial gleam. If you know where it is, you could maybe discover something. And uh, I mentioned this, that yesterday they move and become glial cells, or they can stay there. We can manipulate that by forcing expression of notch or forcing expression of its inhibitor. We can do gain of the function, loss of the function. That's all possible to do. But you see what happened? These cells are attached here with end feet and junction, adherent junctions. And here they have to dissolve that. Whether they become glia or become neuron which move, they have <coughs> detached themselves from junction which are on, on the ventricular zone. And Ted is electron microscopist. You know, we knew that you know, 30 years ago that if you look ventricular zone, there are end feet and there are very hard junction among that. But people forgot about that. Okay, so what, how they detach and then make polarity to migrate? Okay, so what I'm going to show, how they detach, and like here, you see going either to be some ventricular cell migrating or glial cells. Either of these, they have to detach to go. Now, in addition to notch and numb, which I mentioned, is suddenly involved the third molecule. I learned now that it's, it's one molecule influence the other. It is called E-cutherin. It is for cutanins, uh, families, and so on. Now, how you localize that? Again, the most uh, modern method could be applied to that question that I was wondering, uh, you know, 30 years ago how this occurred, but I couldn't do it. First of all, you can do molecular methods. You could do co-immunoprecipitation and show that NAM and e cadherin that NAB inhibitor of notch, and e cadherin co-precipitate. Then you can co-localize them in that adherent junction. And how you do that? And I have a postdoc from uh, Russia, uh, Yuri Morozov. I didn't have to say that he's from Russia, very typical name, Morozov from Siberia. Okay, so he uh, is very good electromicroscopist, and um, 
so what we did, you see, we uh, put, uh, and actually this one is done by Russians who is from Croatia. Let me just put it very clearly to, to try to give them credit because this is very hard uh, method. Uh, this is Rocky Russian from Croatia, his postdoc in Shestan's lab now. And you see here, you attach a cutting with, with uh, small particle goals and uh, here green and uh, uh, arrows and red arrows you attach uh, uh, with, uh, with numb. And then you see they co-localize together. You see it at a very close level. Now, so what happened? Then you make, uh, you, you then do in uterine electroporation, so-called uh, short RNA or iRNA. And you see this is control, cells are there, and beautifully radially oriented. If you have either numb, and you incorporate that and inhibit that, or e cut here, and you have the same thing. Cells lose their organization, they are not radially organized, and, and instead of migrating, they are kind of accumulate here in rosettes. And this occurs because you interfere with this junction, and here is the EM level. And I don't know whether people at the back could see that, but this is here, these are this junction between radial glial migrant uh, in dividing cell in this junction. And you could interfere with them. And when you disrupt it adherent distribution, then you disrupt also called adherent junction, and you dis disturb neuroepithelium, you disturb radial organization. Here it is maybe better shown what happened. This is in controls. This is in knockout, double knockout, numb, numb-like. Here it is. And then you have these rosettes of in double knockout of cells which don't exist here, okay? And in EM level, you see beautiful organization and control in knockout is disturbed. You could have examine an EM level whether these are uh, there uh, uh, dis uh, disturbed this junction in knockout compared to control. You could do quantification of that. And therefore, come to conclusion that e cut here this is the junction of protein, maintain adherence junction and promote radial polarity, polarity radial glial cells in a manner similar like numb and numb like. So you remember I yesterday I mentioned to you that you could make more cells and less cells because you could keep radial glial longer. And here it is, very nicely shown. Normally P10, there are no radial glial cells. But look at the P10 in, in, in numb uh, uh, when you have that you see, they are preserved at P10. And it is the same thing when you do have a preserved cut here. This is at a higher level. Now, so you have the touch cell. You polarize it so that so-called basal is extended through the cortex. But now you have to have a, you remember I said you have to extend the leading process. It has to be molecular mechanism for that. When I entered the field, that you remember when I was talking about 25 years ago when cells were simple, you see, we have seen that that leading process is extending. And at that time, even just doing purely EM, you could publish even a nature paper. Not anymore. This is the lesson for people who are now thinking this transgenic mice will be forever. OK, so you see. What happened? Cell extend. You could at that time interpret that. This is leading process. It's then this phylopodia, probing, you know, like a finger. And then go along one of them, you see, and then extend and go along this one. And when you see in this leading processes, I don't see whether you could see it, but there are these vesicles are adding. New membranes are adding, so-called exocytosis. So we thought of that. And this is what at that time we called differential adhesion and gliophilic heterotypic, and that extend the leading process. Now, 
I'll show you totally. This is not even in press. This is not even written. So my graduate student, um, uh, uh, Latinich, is working on that. This is exo-70 molecule. That molecule actually is, is one which is discovered in yeast. And it's one of the molecules. It is by Novik, who is at Yale, yeast geneticist and work on that, and they uh, published the paper in 1996. And there are complicated things even in, in yeast. Look at what yeast have to do in order to add a vesicle so that it move, because yeast also grow. OK, and one of them, you see 70, it's called exo-70. And it is attachment, uh, presumably tetras, vesicle, at a specific type, site in plasma membrane. So we said, well, is it possible that this is preserved? And so this is what uh, Letinich uh, did, this in preparation still. So he had this is a control, and you uh, put that, and you stain. This is electroporation. You see label cells. They go, and this is three days later, four days later, they are in the cortex. But if you have a dominant negative, exo-70, cells didn't migrate. This is control, and this is you see, so therefore, you have molecular mechanism to add those membranes there. Just if you think pathological mechanism, whatever interfere with that, whether it's genetic, environmental, would prevent cell to come right place, right time. Then migratory, have to select migratory pathway. You remember I said differential adhesion, go along a radial glial. There are several molecules there. Astrotactin is Mary Beth Hatton and Rockefeller work on that. This is a, 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 a new neuronal junction uh, protein, A1. It's, I don't like a name, but this is discovered actually by a person who was at that time postdoc in my life, Eva Anton. He's now uh, already associate professor at uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. And, uh, and it actually, that molecule was discovered Richard Cameron when he was postdoc in the lab. And he published that long ago. And you see between the neuron and glial, and this is, you can see that localization in between. And this is kind of part of published work, and Mary Beth Hutton worked a lot on that. And in order to go you to the next stage, I learned lesson from yesterday. Even I can learn lesson. So it says, yesterday I have too many slides, so I took out Three slides this afternoon while, the, uh, while, while um, Ted was waiting for me. But then I took three slides out. You think I learned a lesson. Then I put five more in. <laughs> so you never learn a lesson, OK? So what I did here, I want to show you what happened is, uh, is how that cells go to the next stage. Uh, did I make it? OK, next stage. So what happened is the cells have to come inside out. You have to do what, what is there involved in putting that cells in the proper position. And, and it is interesting that in my lab, we work on reeling. Long ago, I'll show you a slide in a moment. And we work on a notch. I show you already now. And in real and how old? 1978 uh, with Vern Cavines, this is a review of the work that he did and I did partly um, uh, on the realer mouse. This is mouse in which one single autosomal gene mutation occur. And cells do not come in this proper inside out position. Normal mouse, litter mate, injected with 16 with, at that time, thymidine. And sacrifice one month of age, labeled more superficial cell. I told you, it's not like in monkey very sharp, but superficial, not in deep. But in realer mouse, because of this single mutation, look, cells are distributed elsewhere. And then we did anatomy at that time. And you see this pyramidal cell, this is long, uh, large pyramids. Instead of being here, they are now there. And these other cells here are mixed with supply cells over here. They receive proper input, proper input. This here uh, and or this here are proper input for those cells. But they are in wrong order, a sequence. And what happened? Mouse real. And mouse is mentally tired. Mouse is not good 
solving problem on maze and so on. Why I mention that now, just you remember yesterday we talked a little about stem cell and so on. You see, if cell here is just one day late and come on the wrong position, mouse read, one day late in the embryology. If you now think to inject stem cell in the 54 years old individual, you're 54 years late. <laughs> yeah. OK, so if they don't come at the right time, just one day, it will not be good. So it's not that it's not possible. It's not simple. It's not that every cell will go and occupy other cell and everything will be good. Because that cell have to come in layer 4, after layer 5, but before layer 3. And if this not occur in normally, that brain is not right and animal will have problem of mental retardation or epilepsy. Okay? Now, we conclude time of origin define phenotype. See, so you have to think the time of origin uh, ago. Now, th this is real mouse. I'm still talking to you. This is done in my lab. They even keep colon. And then we work on, of, on notch. And you remember I talked about notch and cell division and adhesion. But Nena Shestan, when he was postdoc still in the lab. Oh, this is misspelled. OK, I'm in a hurry. OK. Um, uh, he discovered when, well now it's already about seven years ago, that, uh, that there is a nuclear notch, that notch in adult neoco, adult, this is postnatal, adult, go uh, in, um, into nucleus of the cell. He, and it was difficult to know what is the function, and he then discovered, he published another paper in science uh, that same year. That, um, that is relevant to the formation of processes. Is it possible that, that these two molecules have something in common, that they cooperate? We didn't think about that until Kazui Kishimoto Tori, she's postdoc from Japan, looked and took notch. This is wild type, and you see nuclear notch. I told you that. That was discovered seven years ago by Nana Shestan. Is there in the wild type. But in real, it's diminished. It's not there. That was interesting. So she started to look what is happening with the notch. So this is wild type mouse, and she looked orientation of migrating cells as they come to the cortex. You see in real, this is what is happening. They there could not penetrate and come penetrate previously generated cells. When she look in Reeler, there are much more processes there. Okay? See here is single process leading. Reeler have several processes. And so cell do not go, cannot penetrate previously generated cell. You remember it has to go inside out. So this is generated, you have to go. So you have two processes like that, cannot move. And here in notch, you found same phenotype. This is actually quantification. This is under review. It's still I'm giving you unpublished data. Then what we did, um, sh sh they, we then look what happened if you force delete notch using, again, um, um, special promoter for electroporesis. This is so-called uh, uh, tubuling alpha-1 protein, which is only in post cell here. And in control, if you do it, electroporation at 14, uh, and six days later, cells are in the cortex. But if you put notch, notch double deletion, cell didn't move up. So suddenly, you, you have a thing that notch and relin are doing very similar phenotype. Are they connected? And this is what probably will make that paper in that journal. Replenishing active notch mitigates migration deficit in realer. And this is normal. In realer, they don't move to, in the proper layer core. And if you add a notch, you resect your realer phenotype. So we came to conclusion, this is still tentative, uh, 
and they want us some additional um, possibilities, is that actually really stabilize notch by preventing ubiquitination. And I don't want to go into d detail about uh, mechanism. This is called DAB. This is involved molecule involved in reeling uh, pathway, produce similar phenotype to reeling. So it act on that, but DAB inhibit destruction of the of the notch. And if you now um, normally reeling is doing that, but if you de remove reeling, there is no inhibition of that. You have degradation of notch, and cell could not move. So you see, we are going from phenomenon of where we knew the molecule, to the molecular mechanism, how it may work. But in order the cell to go from the ventricular zone to the cortex and increasingly distance, and in monkey and human, several hundred times its diameter. You know, human frontal lobe cell have to move not in millimeters, not in microns, but in centimeters, like four centimeters, like a, in the middle of gestation. And how this occur? It's nuclear translocation. And we suggested that name in this early paper in 1971, but that was then nothing happened until 20 years later with Mary Beth Hutton and then also in my lab, we started to look at the remodeling of the, of the cytoskeleton microtubules, which are now allow cells to move within that process. If you do not um, re remodel a um, cage of cytoskeleton, cell would not be able to move that process within that leading process. And so we start to look at that, and this is where we come to the filamin, which is contractile protein. And MEC, this is mitogen activating kind of uh, kinase, kinase 4. And I tell you a story about that. Again, two molecules that how we came to that to look at that is come from human. These are people, but this is with Chris Welch, Walsh lab, and uh, this one. You see, in human, mutation and disturbance of filament mutation make heterotopia. You see, cell didn't move in human. Okay, this is so-called periventricular, periventricular um, ectopia. Now, it's interesting why they didn't move is because filament idea is they didn't have a motor to, to push the nuclei in. So this is how it go, uh, filament A, and then you have that. This is actually another pathway through junk molecule. We also work on this one several papers that make double courting is different one. This is periventricular, this is <coughs> cell come below the cortex but don't go in. This is from the work on human. This is Gleason, who was I think the student actually with Walsh and Fengen and Walsh. So we said we will look at that. So I said okay I want to know more about this MEC4. And the same colleague that I have, molecular biologist Lavelle, uh, said, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is actually, there are several of these mechs and they are uh, scaffolding, uh, work with scaffolding uh, uh, with filament, they are interacting. So it was a simple kind of drawing. I said, I want to mo know more about it. And they said, okay, here it is. <laughs> okay, so I said, you think a neuroanatom is uh, uh, complicated? Okay, so if you look at that, you know, you could have one hour lecture on that, but if you look carefully, even I have to look, you see here is a MAC4, this is our molecule. <laughs> but see what it does, cell motility, inflammation, apoptosis, osmoregulation, okay? Here it is, but you see this, by the way, we are working on that one GIP too, and actually we'll soon have a, one paper on that, but I'll just talk to you about now MAC4. So I said to Max Sarkisian, his postdoc, I said, look at that, whether that's in, so it starts a human, like whether it's in mouse. So he looked, this is mouse, and this is a human. And he looked, and yeah, and this is forebrain, and this is human. We had a hard time to get this tissue, but we did 63, 87, 91. And you see, it's here, okay, in forebrain. In mouse, is there. But if you have mouse, and this Richard Flavel make a mutant, I mean, 
knockout, look, it's not there. So let's look what happened in the, uh, that mutant. They did it for totally different reason. They studied T cells, he is immunologist, and this, this is for different reasons. But when you look, this control, it is a knockout mouse. You see? It's disturbed this ventricular zone here. This is knockout MAC4. Then, when you look, and we just published that in December, um, uh, and you see normal, this is same mouse is just uh, next, so to speak, embryo. You have to do, of course, genotype. You see how it's disturbed? You have the, like a double cord in here, and you have periventricular uh, conolatia. You can shoot, then he labeled that with the, uh, dexibromouridine, and you see the cell didn't move. This is normal, didn't move in the mouse. We have that mouse. So then he did, we are using the most advanced methods. This is RNAi and study MAC. If you, you, you go, you could do in utero. You put, you know, electrodes here, you inject DNA, and you uh, can deflect that, um, affect that gene activity. So normally, if you have normal in control, cells and migrate in three days, here they stay. Now, if you look at the higher level, you could see that these which stay are neurons because they are positive for, uh, for TBR1 and stain also with, with BRDU. So they stay in the ventricle. So what you have normally cell migrate, become the touch from glia become neuron, you remember. Here they do not migrate and remain here in, instead of being in the cortex, remain here. Okay? So just to, to, to show you normally cell migrate, here we have ectopia. But then you can look molecular mechanisms. This example, you see a lot of question mark. We have to still do some work here or there. But this is MAC4 through FLIP. This is another molecule. Filament, arrest migration, cytoskeleton defects. But if you go through the different pathway, this junk gene, then it go to double cortin. Then you have the other deficit in human. You remember one is double cortin. Cells didn't come below cortex, don't go in. In the other, cells stay near ventricle. Everything unfolds from the, these results as a possibility of having model for human disease. Then I said cells have to be on time. What the control rate of migration? And this is what we did a few years ago. This is Hitoshi Komura, who was a postdoc from Japan. And we did um, then look, he, he was physiologist and he did, you know, ion channels. And ion channels were done for people only for synapses, uh, for synaptic transmission. But we recognize that these uh, channels and receptors, everything exists before there are synapses. In fact, some of these channels exist in animals don't have even a nervous system. What they are doing there? So we looked and we found that calcium fluctuation regulated by these uh, uh, calcium channels uh, are regulated, so it's got more calcium. It, re, re, here is uh, uh, calcium fluctuation in totally in register with, with the speed of migration. So I don't put here other studies. He has several other studies that if you put agonist and antagonist at these channels, you could regulate speed of migration, make it two times faster or two times slower with a detrimental effect on the neuronal migration. So what calcium signaling doing? Calcium is everywhere. Calcium is in the tree out on the street. Uh, and, uh, and, but it is also involved in neuronal proliferation, this ion channels with calcium fluctuation. This is Tari Hardai. When he was in the lab, we published that. He's now a professor in the University of uh, Georgetown in Washington. This is why, and this is quoted, I think, is that nectar, because that was done in, I think, Christine's laboratory. Then calcium is associated with cerebral and cerebellar migration. This is proliferation migration. Hitoshi and I published many papers. I put only two here. And these are in other labs, 
that are already confirmed that thing. And then that candidate calcium transient, or they interact with GABA, glutamate, glycine, ATP. I show you now in the moment some of those data. So what I will put that at the end of the talk. Okay, so look, uh, cell have to to do that cytoskeletal arrangement, to divide and to make translocate nucleus, you have to have calcium. And this is P2Y1 and connexin, I will mention to you, okay? So this is where this, uh, uh, this PY, uh, y, uh, P2Y1 is uh, actually a ligand for, the, it's, uh, for receptor ATP signal. And this is discovered, this is Leturco, John Leturco, when he was with Crickstein, you see they make these columns and they attach on cells. It's a communication between radial glia and neuroprogenitor. That's kind of known. But what we did, we now examine what happened uh, in that is really this P2 uh, Y1 expressed in the ventricular zone. And indeed it is, you see. This is double labeled here with, with, with nuclear marker, and it's here in ventricular zone. It has effect. If you take blockers, like a suramine, you disturb frequency. Actually, doesn't disturb, disturb amplitude, but only fre frequency. So you know it's active. And look what it does with migration. This is normal control. And how it's done, this is, this is divided in six bins. And you look where cells are, you know. And in control, they are like that. This is control. You see there are more green cells here and very little here or there. In suramin, cells stay near ventricle here. And so to the other blocking agents um, for recruitment of calcium, either from the cytoplasm or from the storage resort. Now, why I'm talking to you, you see, why we're doing this study? It is under review now in Neuron, actually. Shuashin Liu, Liu is first author. Is that some of these drugs are used in... Uh, in non-inflammatory, um, in anti-inflammatory, no st stero steroidal drugs. For example, in Africa, tse disease of the sleeping disorder, when this tse bug it, uh, um, infect people, and woman could be pregnant, she get anti-inflammatory drug. We showed that this could affect migration. If she's pregnant, her offspring would have her cells in wrong position. So this kind of important we are studying. And that we then found that protein, this gap junction or heavy protein, connexin 26, is also central to neuronal migration. And you see if you block it, this is normal control. And this cell migrate here, here didn't move. This is quantification of that. And over time, it's improved a little, but not much. So why have I mentioned that? That connexin. 26, there is also connecting 46. When I show you mi migration defect in X radiation, it turns out that X ray affect connexin. So this could be mechanism how X ray involve migration. You see how many things you could, you could have drugs, you could X radiation, you could have many things that could affect. And this affect cells activity because cells are active, I think, uh, I talked with uh, uh, Kim uh, yesterday about that. What is activity? Well, uh, active, there are no synapses, but you see activity, and you can interfere with this activity, and cells didn't move to the cortex. This is BRD you study. Normally would come here. Many cells are left here. You can quantify that. This is in preparation. We didn't yet even publish that, but you interfere with activity. Why it's important? Well, many drugs, exposure, of pregnant woman to life, we found the stress too. Could affect neuronal migration. And finally, it has to stop. I should go a little faster. This is, by the way, with Eva Anton. We have a molecule which is involved in stopping cell here. And that is present in radial glia, its localization. And 
when we interfere with that molecule, we have realer phenomena. In control cell go here, if you inject, say, 16 embryonic day. But if you inject 16 embryonic day with dexibromouridine and interfere with their pathways with this, we call radial glial associated protein antibody, cells stay here. So we made realer phenomenon by using antibody against one molecule that Eva Anton discovered in the lab actually in 19, 2000. Now, why we was published, he already was asked and professor over there four years later, because when we have that slide, it was rejected from neuron. They say, well, you don't have transgenic mass. And so he could either publish somewhere else or wait for transgenic mouse. And he waited. It paid off. We have transgenic mouse, which was made in Harvard, not by us. And you see it in transgenic mouse, we found out what is that molecule. It's called SC1 protein, recognizes that antibody. You have disturbance of neuronal migration in a way that cell migrate to the cortex, but don't pass or have trouble passing each other, like in real. Another molecule, same phenomenon. Well, I talked to you about molecular mechanism at the time. I said, I will come back why I showed one slide of timing a different position in different areas. I wanted to finish that, but just say that it has significance not only to think how evolution of cortex occurred. That's very important. I enjoy it. That's my favorite subject. But it's also important for medicine. And as my professor that I quote yesterday say, every medical question can be reduced evolutionary question. In, in this case, we will reduce evolutionary question to medical question. So I mentioned to you two names that I made. By the way, I made also neurophilic and gliophilic. But this is, and the reason why I make names is because I don't know English as, <laughs> as uh, Leo, who run away uh, from, uh, from my talk, uh, mentioned. And so I made this a few years ago called neurodislocation syndrome. And I was thinking about subtle disorder of neural position. What I'm talking about, neuropathologists would never see anything wrong with the brain. They said, it's normal. This might be psychological and so on. Oh, you know, this is for psychoanalysts to look. I think that there are things when brain is not, cortex is not normal because neurons are not in the right position. Slightly off, enough to make you wonder. You know, slightly off, normal. I will have to quote, you remember Vali Nauta. He was always criticized that people say animal is normal. And he said, well, yeah, look, this is, rat is totally normal. And he said, if you want to know whether this rat is normal, you have to ask Mrs. Rat. <laughs> because in brain and the cortex, there is a lot of things that looks normal, but you think when you look in a subtle way, not. So I talk subtle disorder in neuronal position. This is dyslexia. This is autism. This is uh, uh, attention deficit syndrome. I don't believe that you have any pathology without uh, biology. It's not recognized by neuropathologists because they look. Nothing there. Probably, therefore, underestimated. And now I will talk to you, cause the very symptom. And I should talk about this if I have time. But I will show, and this is why I show that slide. So all my talk here was to come you to understand what that slide means. Diverse symptoms. So if you don't know what you will get, a few takes, say, German measles, we know interfere with cell division and migration. And if mother, and this is monkey mother, is get it at, say, this embryonic day, 60, could affect superficial layers, layers 2 or 3, cortical, cortical. This is area 24. It is limbic system. It is single edge gyrus, 24. That person may have emotional problem because it's limbic system, as you know. I hope you have good uh, courses here in anatomy and, and neuroscience. 
Limbic system is emotional brain. You affect that. But if the mother have general measles in this age, it will not affect limbic system because cortical cells are already generated in that place, but could affect, say, motor system, or could affect frontal lobe and have a problem of, of, uh, of putting word in proper order and so forth. So single genetic on environmental factor can produce great variety of cortical disorder depending on the time of insult. So many, same thing can produce everything. And variety of genetic disorder can produce similar disorder. So if this is affecting limbic system here, emotional, like in autism or something like that, you could uh, get it with German measles. You can get it with the, the drug, uh, anti-inflammatory non-steroidal drug, or with steroid drug, or with stress, or exposure to X-ray, or some other physical agents that I could mention, because there is no a chemical or physical agents that could not affect such a delicate process like neuronal migration. And here is something that Malaspina, uh, uh, she sent me that, she's in Colombia, that she's, just to show you how important this time is. She looked at the effect of six war, uh, six day war in Israel. And if woman is pregnant, it was stressful to them. Their husbands are in war, can be killed and so on. If they are in early pregnancy, they have this type of disorder. If they are in this pregnancy, they have this type of disorder. So depending how long you are pregnant, at the time of the war, you have population with psychiatric disorder, population of their offspring when they become adult. Depending when your mother, how far she was pregnant during six day war was stressful, okay? Uh, so why I think this is important, you see, this has causes of my type of mental retardation. It's a chromosomal, and this and that. You see this big red thing? This is unknown. This is called idiopathic disorder, childhood epilepsy, autism, dyslexia, and so on. Effects of drug, both abuse and therapeutic, alcohol, irradiation, etc. So I thought that this could kind of justify looking at neuronal migration because it make possible to make evolution of our brain. But also it justify because it could explain disorder that we still don't have in our grasp. So I wanted just to end up this talk to show you how this is. And I took it from, I gave a recently lecture in Oxford. This was called Sherrington Lecture. So I bothered to go and read his thing. He was an excellent writer, you know. At that time, they read better than we do. And he was talking about, he was talking about physiology, how brain become enchanted loom, where millions of flashing lights wave and so forth. And this is what I see in migration. I didn't have time to go to you, but migration occurs also horizontally, so-called tangential migration. So this is what you have. Some shall go up, some shall go down, some have laterally. And when you look at that, you, and this is so complicated, I think you actually wonder how many of these brains are actually functional, or our brains, hopefully. Okay? Unless somebody asks us, pauses, you know. <laughs> and the, uh, okay. But, so I promised tomorrow we were talking about art. People talk at dinner, and not everybody was not there how it's relating to the science. And I said, I wanted actually to be artist. And I promised I will show you, and it's relevant to that. You see how this go? And every cell now and don't collide with the other, go to the proper address. And this reminds me when I came to this country, and I make that painting in 1966, exactly. <laughs> oh, here, 66, but here, okay. And this was, I was, came from the country, I didn't have car. And there are a lot of cars there. They go everywhere in New York City and, you know, and they go and they all seemingly know where they are going. Like this migrating cell along the pathways which lead them there. 
and then I try to say, let's look at neuronal migration. Look, look at the molecular pathway. Look at the higher magnification, look EM. And here is that car is going, you know, oh, good, now I know better. Then back of higher magnification, oh, still here going on. Then I go, oops, I then, just a moment, and, and then I come to that. And this is the danger. If you look neuronal uh, uh, at the single molecule and not pay attention in vivo study in the whole animal, look, you would not even know that this is a car, nevertheless, whether it's going and where it's going. So you have to go back to the whole picture, and this is my advice to young scientists. And this is very multidisciplinary work. I have a very talented people who are doing that, and they are listed here. And also, even now it's enough in my lab, I collaborate with Flavel lab I mentioned. I forgot to mention here a few other people. In his lab, Shestan lab, Nena Shestan, this is done, who is who was doing Notch, and this is Rock Kira Lashin. And for all of this, you need the money, and this is where I got that money for that. Thank you very much. I'm sure Pastor is willing to answer a few questions. It's probably a great place to start. <laughs> um, what's known of the adhesion systems that are responsible for the preferential uh, selection of the radioglia? cells by these migrating uh, neuroblasts. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm saying. We, we, there, there is a one molecule that, that was described and um, discovered by Mary Beth Hutton, Astrotacti, and you can look at the literature. She was looking, but she was looking mostly in the, in the migration of granule cells in the cerebellum. Then we discovered these other molecules, and I show you that uh, antibody to that molecule. And this hair molecule was on neurons and adhesion to the radioglia. We have a radioglia which look the, to be attached to the, the, the neuron. And at the molecular level, we, we did study on that in the culture, we did study the slice preparation and so on, but didn't go farther down with this molecule. Um, uh, we don't have, for example, deathogenic mouse yet and so forth. And so Richard Cameron, who went and to the University of Augusta, Georgia, he is working on that. I, it's not yet in the published uh, form. But it's, I didn't show other, it's now coming very clearly that, say, tangential migration, which go like that, are, they have different molecules on each other. So this is how they distinguish pathway between each other. syndrome in clinical medicine called fetal alcohol syndrome where um, the mother has excessive exposure during pregnancy to ethanol. Has, has anybody or has your lab looked at uh, alcohol uh, in terms of its possibility in affecting neuronal cell migration? I did not. Other, I mean, I that that's a very good study from Seattle here in, in the north, uh, and in, from England. It's called uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Cell migrate to the cortex, but somehow it's like a drunken uh, human. Don't know where to stop. <laughs> and so they bypass this border between marginal zone and enter marginal zone. And in fetal alcohol syndrome, it's very well established neuropathology. There is a visible, it's not subtle. Of course, this is not one glass of Chablis. I mean, that, that pregnant women were drinking a bottle of gin a day or something. So this is, a, now, mo animal model exists. Michael Miller did many studies, including published one in Science, I think, on the, when you expose mouse or rat to that, you have same syndrome in mouse. So this is, I didn't even mention, I didn't mention in our department, Mike Lidov, who unfortunately just died a few months ago. A uh, very early age. Uh, uh, he showed cocaine. Uh, I usually I call this. Actually, if you want, I can show you slides. It's <laughs> I don't know whether I have it here. Um, um, it, it is um, if if monkey is exposed to 
ah, but this now cannot work here. This diminishes so much that I cannot move my slide. Okay. Uh, the only way would be just to look by, by, by chance that it's here. And I will talk. So what he did, he would inject monkey with, uh, with uh, uh, dex, uh, in 70 embryonic, they have a cells label, as I show. And then inject another monkey with 70 day, and then expose to cocaine. By the way, monkey doesn't like cocaine. If you can, they wouldn't just spit water. So, so they had to do infuse that they, they were uh, uh, putting uh, annually, uh, how you say, supervisoria. And they get cocaine, cells are distributed. I have beautiful slide of his, it's published. Um, Lido is first author. I don't know, maybe I don't have it here. Uh, have some other talks about that. I think cocaine is not here. I would have to go to different file. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, cocaine. And this is cells are in wrong position. So, so co cocaine baby. And actually, in New Haven and downtown, it's a large number of, of uh, uh, pregnancies were exposed to cocaine. And that is something that, that um, once the cell is in that position, nothing you can do. That people will be branded all their life, they will not be up to their genetic. They could go to school and so on, but they will not be very good because some of their cells are in the wrong position. If it's a motor system, they will not be good in basketball or whatever, pitching, whatever is difficult. So, so this is, uh, again, they will have that dislocation syndrome. However, when they die, we know in monkey, cells are distributed like that label. When they die, human, and pathologists look that he will say norm, brain is normal. The only way how he would see is somebody inject these people during pregnancy when mother took cocaine, take dexibromelia. This is why it's not discovered in human. And this is why I think by doing, working in monkeys in an animal, we discover it. We would never discover it without animal work in animal. And human cannot see pathology because whether this cell is here or there is pyramidal, Pathologists cannot say when it's generated and whether it's in the wrong position in respect to its time of origin. But you remember yesterday I said time of origin determines the function. So if you move that, you have a cell which is not very good place. There's a suggestion in autism that uh, from Rubenstein and Mersenick that there's an altered ratio of the excitatory to inhibitory uh, connectivity. Yeah. Is there a way that you can link deficits of migration to some kind of functional outcome like that, that it would be pervasive? Yeah, it could be, and there are some people who suggested that, infant dyslexia and autism. And we uh, did actually study and published, and I didn't put it here on purpose, uh, a study, for example, exposing to the large, not doses, same doses as a human, but multiple exposure to, for example, uh, ultrasound, mouse, and cells were more dispersed. Not much, but sufficient that if you have, we have 300 mice exposed, exposed in um, 150 and 150, and those 150 were exposed, has statistically significant more dispersion of cells than the other. And so immediately people are thinking whether it could be one of the causes of, of things like that, especially if it is, say, in the limbic system and so on. However, um, I didn't want to discourage that people take it uh, because it's, uh, ultrasound is very important. You would miss some disease or, or other things. So uh, especially if it's short. So on the basis of that paper, this is why Tom Cruise didn't buy uh, his machine. He wanted to buy a machine and because he can afford it. And during dinner, when he has a dinner with his wife and glass of wine, to be in company with his baby and to, to bond, as they say. And so when our paper came out, they didn't allow to, him to do that, long exposure. So we, we get the grant and we are working. I have three people working on that. 
We are exposing monkey to, to that, uh, to, to ultrasound. So we inject like, it's now you are an expert, uh, with, with dexibromouridine, a 70 embryonic day, and then expose 72, 73, 74, 30, three times a day for 45 minutes, large time, with the same machine and same dog. So it is double blind study, I will not know until next year. And before that, so I didn't want to, to discuss that, but I think it's a possibility that have mild effect. You mean that will be different from different areas? Right, within a normal population, which can account for Yes, differences. it could be, and as, as I said, I recommend that paper will come out, uh, as I said, you were not, did I mention that at the dinner of the talk about Rubinstein's paper, John Rubinstein, on the talk, okay. So Ro Rubinstein have a paper in uh, press in, uh, in PNAS and uh, why I know it, because I communicated it, uh, to, uh, it there. Um, and he has uh, some molecules that are just exposed to the, uh, the just expressed, not exposed, in the, in the ventricular zone subjacent to the prefrontal cortex, and not in the other. And then if you manipulate that, you could make it larger and smaller, not affecting the size of other areas. I was very excited about that. And um, uh, so it is possible that in the future somebody will have a molecule for the visual or so on. But it doesn't mean that later on, as we discussed even today, like a plasticity didn't occur because it just give a preference by frontal is here, there, and then it's adjusted by when the connections are made later on. But uh, original cell have to be different in prefrontal and occipital, because occipital already attract geniculate. And, you know, pool winner go to area 18, but not 17. So it must be that these m cells are different, yeah. And we are just now, op that's become opening to look at uh, how this aerial uh, markers are made. Great, great value out of you today. Thank you so much.